Before we get into it, I just wanted to thank you for following me into this tilted rabbit hole where we learn about the entrepreneur journey and all the magnificent and terrifying things that come with it. If you're an entrepreneur and you want to increase your brand exposure, network internationally, and gain insights, then follow the breadcrumbs in the show notes to my site where you can find everything you need to start your business, grow your brand, and accelerate your income today. I even have a live show every Monday that you can attend. It's free brand awareness and exposure, and you get to meet some really cool people on the show. It's such incredible value, and you don't have to pay a penny for it. Now it's time. Let's jump straight into the rabbit hole. Thank you so much for coming on the Entrepreneur Spotlight today, Cameron. It's amazing to have you here. Um, just for those Thank now you. tuning in, do you want to just let them tell them your name, um, what you do, and name of your company? My name is Cameron John Robbins. I'm also known as the Gentleman Artist. I am a portrait painter and figurative sculptor. The paintings that you see behind me are examples of my work, uh, portraits of historical personalities. Uh, my website is gentartist.com, and I'm available for international work. That's really cute. No, honestly, you've been, you are an absolutely incredible artist. Like, the work mm -hmm. that you do, the work that I've seen you do is just unreal. So... How long have you been in this business for? Uh, I guess it depends on what you consider the starting point. I've always been an artist. I'm one of those extreme personality, creative personality types where uh, being an artist wasn't really optional. The only thing was to figure out what exactly I was going to do and how to make that work. I've been... Tried, someday I'll learn how to speak. I've been well, predominantly paint. what you paint. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Yeah, I, I I make pictures because I can't do math. Uh, no, I've I've been primarily a portrait painter for about the last seventeen years. Wow. So I've done a few hundred at, by this point. In fact, I just got back from a road trip to Georgia, Blue Ridge, Georgia, delivering a portrait to a pair of delightful lovely wonderful clients oh my god and you hand deliver them as well i did this time you see i part of my brand part of my business model is i focus on the experience of the client so it, it's almost like a little game for me uh, to think of ways that I can surprise and delight my clients in addition to creating yeah. portraits for them. So, I mean, because it takes me between six months and a year to complete a portrait, depending upon its size. And that's a long time to keep somebody waiting. And, you know, you can give them periodic email updates and progress photos and things like that. And that's fine. But I thought, ooh, what else can I do? How can I surprise them? And so uh, I'll just use the clients I just mentioned as an example. He's from France. She's from Georgia. And they split their time. They travel all around the world uh, with their business. And so during the process of making their portrait, you know, emailing with them and sending progress photos. But I also send a, a random greeting card. Or one time last year, I thought, okay, she's from Georgia. She spend most, spends most of her time in Europe now. What if I surprise them with a, a box of uh, southern praline candies? It's, 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 a, it's a regional thing that they specialize in. And so I sent a box of pralines to France to just surprise them and they they lost their minds and that was exactly the reaction i was hoping for but you know it's just it's almost like a i guess it's a game it's like what can i what can i think of to really get them excited touch base with them again and say i'm still here i'm still thinking about you and and do it in ways that 
they're never going to anticipate because who does that? I love how much thought you put into the customer experience because that is so important, but especially with your type of work as well, because it's such a personal thing. It is really Mm -hmm. nice to, you know, also have that personal touch to it because you're literally painting them. And it's, it is a very intimate experience when you think of, especially like traditional, Mm -hmm. traditional painters and traditional portraits were done face to face before. So now, I mean, the internet's changed a lot of that. We've got photography that you can kind of paint from photograph, but it is, it is still like every brush stroke is really, Mm -hmm. it's, it's deliberate and it, it mm-hmm. is very, very personal. So you're putting your time and your energy literally with every brushstroke into this piece. So it's partly your exactly creation, right. but it's also a representation of them. So it is such a personal, personal thing. And obviously, yeah, it's, it's almost be, intimate. It, it, it is it, it very can, intimate. Yeah, it's one has to be very, very sensitive in what I do to the client. Yeah. And you can't predict everything. But it just the way I navigate that partly is I start from a particular philosophical baseline, which is that I am looking at a fellow child of God. Now, I, I don't really care whether my client is a believer in anything in particular or nothing at all. That's not the point. But it's hard for me to imagine anything more elevated or ennoble, ennobling than the the idea that I'm looking at a fellow child of God. How do you how do you top that? And so, as that starting with that as a baseline, I'm trying to show that to them. I'm trying to reveal to them that they are far more than they may have ever imagined. Yeah. And so that gets the whole process started on a very high level positive note. Yeah. Wow, that's just, I mean, you don't really think of it like like on that intimate level, but it is such an intimate thing. And, sure. you know, we don't, because I think, I'm not, I'm not saying that art is dying, but I do think that photography kind of replaced miniatures and portrait paintings, stuff like that. And, you know, you, you and I had a discussion before that you literally paint, mm-hmm. you paint on a, on a medium where when the electricity is gone, it's still going to be there. Like... And it's, yes, <laughs> yes. It's, it's I can make all true. of your NFTs and your crypto disappear like that if I just turn off the power. But we know that yeah. these will last for centuries. Yes, they will. And you know, but it is no just comparison. no, no. There is no comparison, and I and I do believe that there is something, there is something different with having portraits done or any form of. Mm-hmm. I hate to say it, real art because digital art is art, but you know, like physical paintings, like right. you know, the really tangible <laughs> stuff. Um, right. There is something incredibly special about that, and even when you kind of get into the 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 subsets of it, like acrylic versus oil, for instance. I'm a huge fan of acrylic. Okay. But I know you say you paint you paint with oil, but you know, even then. You know, oil painters look at acrylic painters and go, yeah, that's like children's crayons. Uh, well, there's some techni- nerdy technical things that make them just different mediums. And they behave differently. They're, they're really similar, but they do behave differently. And I don't think anybody other than artists would care. I've seen some yeah. really impressively executed acrylic paintings. And another funny example. Um, Frank Frazetta, excuse me, Frank Frazetta is a legendary illustrator. He did all those uh, Conan illustrations in the 70s and 80s that were, you know, super collectible now. He used the same brand, he painted in watercolors, and he uses the same brand of Mickey Mouse watercolor sets like you give to children for his entire career. That's my understanding. And so that's going to be really low grade watercolors according to artists and probably true, but he had mastered the material so well 
that he could make it do exactly what he wanted it to do. And that's all he needed. So See, that is that is innovation in and of itself. Like, because sure. it's it's a matter of doing the most with the least. So he's taken children's watercolors and made mm-hmm. and mastered it to a point in mm-hmm. his career where I don't think anybody can replicate that. Like it's oh, gonna take years. It the it's all the time. Yeah. Um that, that's that's kind of crazy when you think of it. Yeah, it, uh, yeah. You'd think, man, you're famous, you're making money doing this. Why wouldn't you splurge on some really good materials? He didn't need to. And it wasn't about what he spent on it. And maybe the new materials would have performed better. That's That tends to be what you get when you get higher quality art materials. They, they're easier to work with. They perform more beautifully. Didn't matter. He had such complete control over what he was already using. There was no advantage in changing. Um, I mean, or, or look at what uh, Banksy's done with rattle can spray paint. Do you know what? Like, I look at some of his work and I'm like, crazy good. Right. Insane. So it's it's mastering whatever you're using. Yeah. But you made a point uh, that I'd, I'd love to explore a little bit more because I think I understand it a little bit and that is what is the difference between things like photography and and portrait photography versus portrait painting and uh ai art digital art <clears throat> and one of the big differences is i mean there's some wonderful photographers and there's some spectacular photographs but at especially the end portrait of the day, photography like i've seen some absolutely beautiful portrait photography art sure sure but at the final moment, it's still an arbitrary mechanical record of whatever is in front of the camera. Now, a good photographer has a good eye, and they can see a moment and position themselves well, and they can do all sorts of interesting things in post-production of the photograph. But it's still working from an arbitrary mechanical record of whatever is in front of the camera at that moment. An oil painting, or any painting, is more like a record of the artist's movement through space over an extended period of time. And it represents about 100,000 individual decisions. Develop a vision, plan a mark, execute the mark, evaluate the mark, plan the next mark. And it's this unfolding, very slow unfolding over an extended period of time. And... I've experienced this in a unique way because there are several paintings I've done. One of them, uh, Thomas Jefferson. This is the second time I painted Thomas Jefferson from the very same reference materials because the first time turned, I I just didn't love it. So I did it again, but I I was curious to see what would happen if I used the very same reference materials. And the paintings are distinctly different. They're distinctly, it's, obvious that they're made from the same thing same starting point same references but they're not the same painting because it's a different series of 100,000 decisions yeah one painting to the other and i'm not the same it's a little bit like no i was i was actually gonna 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 ask have you seen over the years that even your your brush style, your technique, like how much has that changed from your earlier pieces to now? Uh, just through sheer repetition, I've gained a lot more confidence in what I'm doing and the result I'll get from it. In the early days when I was painting, uh, there was a lot of feeling like I was groping in the dark. So if I did something that looked what looked good, felt like I'd gotten a good result, I wasn't exactly sure how I'd done it. So I wasn't sure I could repeat it. If anything didn't go well, I wasn't sure how I'd gone wrong. And so I didn't know how to avoid it. It was through sheer repetition that I began to crack the code and figure out how to knowingly execute the behaviors to get the results I wanted. Wow. Uh, Order of operations you know, doing what parts in what order and all sorts of things, you know, how to hold the brush, which brush to use, 
I've got oh, a really so random much. question for you. So do you paint background first yeah. and then paint the subject or do you do kind of both almost simultaneously? I always start, because I use an indirect method, I use a glazing technique to get the flesh tones. I always start with the flesh parts of a figure first because I paint that in mixtures of uh, black, white, and uh and a yellow, um, <laughs> I'm suddenly spacing the name of the color, uh, yellow ochre. So it's a very mustardy, browny yellow. Yeah. And when you mix that with black and a little bit of white, you get a very greenish um, color. And that greenish underpainting, when the warm flesh tones go on top of that, you get the activity of primary or contrasting colors, green reacting with warm you know reddish colors and it helps give a much more vibrant uh flesh tone wow. so because because i because the glaze needs to go on to completely dry underpainting i do that first so that i can work on the other things background clothing whatever while that's drying so by the time i get to the point where clothing and background or landscape or whatever the other bits are the the underpainting for the flesh parts has dried sufficiently where i can go in and finish with the glazing and the final detailing so that's my rough order of operations so Excuse i'm me. really curious because as an artist myself, well i call myself an artist an artist myself um to sure. some degree sure. i don't visualize anything so I've got this weird thing. I'm wired a little bit differently. So I can't actually see mm -hmm. how a painting is going to progress on a blank canvas. It, can you do that? Because I know a lot of artists can. So they can always can see the now. painting before it's done. I can now, but that's a big part of the sitting and staring phase of the process. So it yeah. starts with a vision of the final result, which may be more or less clear at the beginning so that again like photography unlike photography there's a reactivity in painting yeah i've got this vision i'm starting down the path to execute that vision the results i'm getting may or may not alter the vision like maybe i get a little moment that i didn't expect some random shape or whatever that draws my attention and feels really special and alters the vision a little bit like ah, i want to keep that that was really cool so let's let's keep that and let it influence so there's some of that but there is a lot of just needing to sit and stare at the painting in progress and run through order of operations in my mind so i, I imagine okay i've got this partially finished painting could do this and that would mean doing you know a b steps a b c d well what would that get me all right that's not so bad but what if i start over here or will that impact what's going needs to happen next over here do i need to do a b and then start h i over here and then do c d because they interact with each other in a way that they need to, you know, there's a lot of that deciphering and planning. You know, you play, I play it out in my mind in multiple ways, uh, trying to find the best order of operations for the next phases. And so it may look like I'm not doing much when I just sit and stare at an unfinished painting. It's like, why doesn't he do something? Oh, I'm doing something. <laughs> you know? You're thinking about because what you're going to do. It's, it's still a journey. You know, maybe I've made yeah. 50,000 decisions up to that point. There's still 50,000 left and I could make some bad ones. Yeah, where, where might I make bad ones? How do we avoid that? How do we <laughs> keep it moving in the right direction? You know, that, yeah. that makes well, it really I, different. You really don't think about how much decision, because people, when people think of painters, they think mm -hmm. of what Hollywood has shown them. So it's these very hyper creative types who are you know like they wear their heart on their sleeves they are they go into the end of the piece and they just paint until it's done and voila 
it's done like it, it's a whole thing whereas that's actually not the real yeah. process the real process takes can take years like this piece I'm working on it's three years in the process mm-hmm. and right. that piece might I might I might never finish it I would like to but and maybe that's it, exactly it, right for that piece who knows but it's it's a it's a growing piece because it's it's moving mm-hmm. and it's changing as I change as a person mm-hmm. and it's even like my whole journey with art has influenced a lot of it because even my my brush strokes have changed so mm-hmm. I have after um visiting the Van Gogh exhibition and looking at mm-hmm. some of his paintings really mm-hmm. really really up close yes. looking at those brush strokes I've realized all of the things that I thought were actually errors were featured in his work so I was like mm-hmm. why am I overthinking this look in, in seeking clean lines and absolute perfection and then I was just like you know what screw it I'm just, gonna, rah, rah, rah. I'm just I'm just gonna have fun with it and that's <laughs> literally what I did <laughs> but honestly Life that's what I did sound effects yeah honestly but it was just like taking a brush and just like okay that's good yes I feel yes. that because like, it was because it was a process of feeling at that point and then I enjoyed mm-hmm the art so much more I enjoy the process so much more in doing it so uh, I mean Mm -hmm. unless you're an artist you won't really even think about any of this but I think it's so great that we're having this conversation because people who are not artists are going to be listening to this people who are not typically ever going to come across or ever going to have any kind of discussions like this you know will be listening to this and it's just it's really important I think for everybody to understand like the process even with any type of art if it's music or painting or digital art whatever even and I will even say and this is going to sound really weird but I even think programming is actually an art form in and of itself because the amount of the um, the process of it it is technical a technical thing but a piece of a a well with like a well written piece of code is beautiful And it's like data can be beautiful as well. And, you know, it's like, it's all of these things and it's all in and of itself has got its own kind of, you know, like feelings behind it as well. But, you know, it's, it's whatever you put your sweat, blood and tears into. And I think that's really important for us to kind of almost bridge the gaps between what we think is as atypical starving artist art world to, Mm -hmm this is also applicable to lots of things that we see day to day because there are if you want to have the starving artists you also have the starving coders who (laughs) you know work for a pittance Uh, there is a certain romanticized mythology attached to the starving artist which is really counterproductive but um let's back it up for just a little bit because art is the execution of design decisions i suppose you could say well, what is design? Maybe we could say that design is the execution of intention. Yeah, I think so. Well, everybody is engaged in that game. When you when you design, when when you pick paint colors for the walls in your lounge, when you pick out the furniture, when you pair those trousers and shoes with that top. Get it. When you're cooking, that jewelry, you're in when you're cooking, everybody's engaged in design all day, every day. Everybody is executing intentions. Um, art, fine art, so called, is just kind of the one of the more extreme uh, representations of that activity, but everybody's engaged in it. And I think there's something really crucial there for people to appreciate because it's a uniquely human activity. You know, you you could take... We're very creative creatures. We all are. We can't help it is is part of my point. It's like, take any culture from any point in history in any part of the world, even the most primitive subsistence cultures where they might not even know if they're going to eat tomorrow. Maybe they didn't eat today. And nevertheless, they will sit around the campfire at night and they'll they'll decorate their tools, their weapons, their clothes, their bodies. They'll dance, they'll sing, they'll tell each other stories. We cannot help ourselves. 
like the most the, the crudest most ignorant prisoner in prison is still going to scrawl doodles on the wall we cannot help ourselves we no. make art as a species and so important point we should, as well we, I'm sorry That's such an there important was little, point is oh there was a little thing so I lost the audio for a second. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I said that's such an important thing because I think it's it's important for us to remember that we are all insanely creative beings and we are mm -hmm. we are wired for creativity, whether we like it or not, whether we think that we're not creative. Like my mom, for instance, she says she can't draw a stick figure. And she says she's not I hear creative. That all the time. Yep. But takes her cooking and then tell me if this woman's not creative. She puts right, stuff right. together, and I'm like, "Oh my god, this is great!" Right, my sister's the same right. thing. My sister, like, my sister is insanely creative. She's one of those like. I started with stick figures. Yeah, we all did. In you look at what like, I do, and you think it's on some different level, and maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Maybe there's just maybe the only difference between what I can do and what you could do is three hundred of those. You know one type yeah. of thing do it three or four hundred times and see where you're at it could just be sheer repetition i was not the most impressive student in art school i wasn't what i am is one of the last ones standing i was just about to ask you so from all of your all of your colleagues because you said you went to art school so all of your colleagues from art school yeah. how like what percentage of them have almost dropped oh, art I, as, a, I, as a career I don't know specifically with my class or anything like that, but I know it's it's a ridiculous attrition rate, like in the 90, above 90%. In fact, I had a professor in school, art school, who he used to say, if you get a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree, you can wait tables in the better restaurants downtown. If you get a Master of Fine Arts, you can be the maitre d'. That is an appalling set of expectations. Um, but that's wow. the reality. And here's part of Part of why, I think, there's a lot of reasons why. First, artists tend to be very poor business people. Yeah. It's not our core attraction. I've become obsessed with business out of personal necessity, and I've found delight in it. But if the world were the way I really want it to be, I could spend all my time in my ivory tower creating with reckless abandon and the world would just come knocking on my door and say the cosmic vibrations of the universe told me that something wonderful artistic was happening here oh and i brought my checkbook wouldn't that be awesome that yes. is ludicrous as a business strategy yeah so artists need to get themselves sorted out a bit we we need to figure out what it is exactly that we're doing, and we need to figure out how to articulate that in terms that are relevant to the people we're trying to reach. I'll give you an example for, for, for myself. I'll use myself as an example. At the risk of it becoming a shameless plug, I'm a portrait painter and figurative sculptor. It's very easy to look at that and think my product is drawings, paintings, and sculptures. That's not my product. They are merely the delivery vehicles for the real product because the real product is feelings and experiences. And it's exactly the same uh, game that you're engaged in when you choose the color for your walls, the outfit you're going to wear that day, which furniture you like. I like this sofa more than that sofa. Yeah. They, they both do the that. same thing, but I like the shape of this car more than that car. All things being equal, humans will choose the thing that they find the most lovely. I mean, what is it? The Louvre generates over $140 million per year. How does it do that off of artwork that hasn't been moved or sold sometimes for centuries? What are people doing there? What are they paying for? Especially since it's uh, free entry and they're just collecting donations of a few euros at the door voluntarily and most people give voluntarily so what are they buying because it's it's the experience of being right. in the same atmosphere as right a centuries old masterpiece 
Like, right. They are paying pay, for feelings yep. and experience. Yeah, absolutely. But, I mean, but that's, especially but that's the Mona exactly Lisa. why we buy art. There are 10 but, million reproductions of the Mona Lisa and everything. You know what? I, I actually do find the Mona Lisa. <laughs> I actually find the Mona Lisa really unimpressive. I haven't seen it like the original in person, but I just find every representation of it is just unimpressive. And I think the only impressive bit that I've seen is the is the AI one where she's actually smiling. <laughs> like, seen, like, I love that. I've I love that. that. Yeah. But like, but, uh, I just I just find the painting itself is really unimpressive. But my opinion of that might change when I'm in its presence, because maybe, it might be just maybe. one of those. Like, if you and maybe if you it go, doesn't. Yeah, and that's okay doesn't. too. But I will never forget the. I'd always kind of been obsessed with Starry Night. And it's been yes. like, yeah, it's been, I've actually got a printed canvas on in my bedroom where I literally stare at it yeah. like all the time because it's just mm-hmm. one of those pieces that mm-hmm. I feel every stroke of it. I don't know why. I mm-hmm. have I have no idea why. And it's actually influenced a lot of my own my own art and the way that I do things his careless abandon with color was just especially in that age in that that time Mm -hmm. but when I was immersed in it because the exhibition that I went to was the immersive 360 exhibition so you're sat there and there are projectors everywhere Mm -hmm. and ceiling to floor kind of experience and Mm -hmm. They had um, they had a walk through a room and it was just completely full of sunflowers, and it was mm-hmm. just because you could so you, you could experience the art is as well like as a physical thing, mm-hmm. and yeah, and his work is was, quite dimensional, even yeah. though it's a two D oh painting. God, yeah, it's 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 very dimensional. It's it's probably one of the reasons why he is or was my favorite artist. Um, my favorite painter of all of all of the greats i think it's also probably because his story is so 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 sad as well and it is i do i do connect with it on a weirdly like personal level but i did too for a long time i did too yeah yeah it's just it's just one of those things where you can you can feel like the (laughs) You could feel everything in all of his pieces, and even something as simple as a sunflower in a vase. Like you can feel, you can feel things that right. come through it, and right. it's not something that I've actually experienced with any other artist. Um, I do feel sometimes with abstract pieces, um, but with with his stuff, it's just it's such mm-hmm. a it's such a visceral experience. I can't. It's yes. it's really yes. it's really really difficult for me to explain. But it is no, just one, like I'm talking about it now. And it's like all my pores are rising. I'm like, oh my god! Give and it's not talking about this You you uh, said something earlier that I'd like to jump back to because we're talking about Van Gogh. I don't know if you ever saw the movie Lust for Life with Kirk Douglas and uh, Anthony Quinn. Kirk Douglas no. plays Van Gogh. Well, you know that uh, Van Gogh and Gauguin were roommates for a time yes. and all, and they painted very differently, and they were very kind of explosive personalities together. Uh, and in the movie, there's a scene where Gauguin accuses Van Gogh of painting too fast. And Van Gogh immediately screams back, you look too fast. And it, it it's wonderful <laughs> because... That, that's insane, because my response to that would have been like, well, you paint too slow. It's not my fault <laughs> you're slow. And, and part, of, part of what I think it was getting at, maybe, was that Van Gogh... I, I believe this is true, but I believe he wrote this of himself, that he had fully executed a painting in his mind before he ever put brush to canvas. He'd run through, kind of like I was describing a few minutes ago, he'd yes, run through yeah. the order of operations in his mind so vividly that when it came to start time to start painting, it was, it was just... just technical execution, execution. Yeah. he didn't have to slow down and think about anything because he'd done it rehearsed it so thoroughly and vividly in his mind but when you when you think that, about that process remarkable. that 
exactly that that is well I mean maybe that's probably what drove him insane because I think about that process and that's mind-blowing and like I'm somebody who I feel like I've got five brains and even that just blows my mind the fact that he's he's completely executed an entire painting in his head from for every brush stroke so he knows at that Mm. point it's all planned so and then he can then almost rewind it and then just execute what his what he's planned in his head it's just right wow and and that's you know the mental discipline of holding your thoughts on a single thing for an extended period of time yeah and that's not unique to artists uh i mean you find that in all sorts of disciplines everywhere everyone it's a tremendously yeah tremendously useful ability to cultivate yeah no, his, his his work is just on another level. But I mean, now going back to business. <laughs> oh God, we we talked about art for quite a while. Yes, I know. Sorry. So, um, how much time do you spend working on your business, not in your business? Uh, more than I'd like. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's a challenge. It's a challenging balancing act. I had to take over the management of my business. Uh, a little over a year ago, I, I, I'd had for a long time an agent, but I needed to bring that relationship to an end. It wasn't yielding the results that I needed it to. And so I had to take over that role for myself. But any business needs uh, more than one expert. So I, I am looking for people who are better at things than I am that are necessary yeah. components of running a business. Because as I said, I'm obsessed with doing business properly. And Absolutely. so, I mean, I've developed some facility as a copywriter and, and a marketer and planning business strategy and making business presentations and all useful things, I think, for an, any artist to cultivate, at yeah. least for an appreciation of what's involved. Like I said, if I said earlier, artists need to do a better job figuring out how to articulate the value of what they do. Yeah. Uh, when you read these lengthy, wordy artist dissertations, well, first off, I think it's a terrible strategy to keep writing those, even though galleries keep insisting that artists write them. It's like, yeah. no, no, stop it. There's two reasons. One, if people don't understand all of that rubbish, you're in, they feel like their intelligence is being insulted. That's a terrible way to make a sale, to make somebody feel stupid. And for those who do understand all of that, they know it's rubbish. They know it says nothing. And it's insulting to them, too. Just stop it. Get better at articulating the value of your work in terms that matter to the people whom you want to buy your work. Yeah. Stop writing this rubbish for the sake of other artists. They're not your customers. They're not going to be your customers. That's true. That's absolutely true. Because artists aren't the ones who <clears throat> usually, I say usually, because there are some artists that do buy from other artists, but they're not usually sure. the the atypical kind of customer. And right. they would usually commission something because artists normally don't right. have the money to buy the... £50,000 piece. They're they're selling their own. Yeah, stop trying to impress your colleagues and competitors. I mean, so a lot of these dissertations or artist statements, they kind of boil down to saying something like, my work is art because I say it is. (laughs) My, My work is art because I says it is. And it has value because I want it to. Yes. Well, who bloody cares? Seriously, genuinely, who cares? I think art should just that is not going to persuade just anybody to take it home with them. No, and I think I think I mean I know selling art's a very tricky thing to do, but I do think that for somebody to own a piece, it should say sure. something personal to them. Whether it's oh, no, I it's want not. this, I want this in my living room because it's it's obscenely expensive, even if it just says that, like. That is that that's is still a something. Business transaction right there. Yeah, absolutely. Because that's it's insanely expensive. I want this. 
in the same way as uh, a panhandler on the street. They're not begging for money. They're selling you the opportunity to feel like a decent human being for a few minutes. Yes. That's a legitimate business transaction. And how, how much right. does it cost you to feel like a decent human being for a few minutes? Well, you get to set the price. They don't. So yeah. there is some of that. Um, and you hit on something important there, which is w one of the reasons that I never criticize the work of other artists. There are certainly works of art that I can't stand. And I think there are there are artists whom I think are complete charlatans and don't deserve any success of any kind. But that's not the point. I'm not their customer. And the reason I don't criticize the work of other artists is this. Think about a time, it's like, have you ever had the experience, I'm sure you have, where so, you've heard somebody criticize a movie or a book or a song or a band that you love. Did you take that criticism personally? Oh, yes, I did. Oh, yes, you did. Everybody How does, dare you, you right not now. like Lord of the Rings? What kind right, but you of pathetic you mouth star breather that are movie. you? You didn't know. You didn't write that book. You didn't, you're not in that band. You didn't write that song. No. But you took it personally because their criticism said something about you, Me. whether they knew it or not. Yep. And that's why I don't criticize the work of other artists. And that's why I encourage other artists not to criticize the work of other artists. Because if you have a prospective collector who's interested in your work and they hear you criticize the work of somebody's art that they already have in their collection, they will cease to be a prospective client for you. Yes, that's so true. And here's here's the other thing. They can love that art, the work of an artist whose work you hate, and they can love your work for different reasons. Yep. And what do you the care? Artist, the artist you hate is probably obscenely expensive, and they love your work because they like your brushstrokes. As simple as as simple as that. They like or, your or vice versa. You know, the, their reasons don't matter. Yeah. How they spend their money is not your business. So focus on finding a way to articulate the value of your work in terms that are relevant to them. I'll, I'll give you an example using my work again. Shameless plug. Here is what my work does. I will make you immortal in the same way that the Mona Lisa is immortal. Think about the wow. Mona Lisa, Girl with the Pearl Earring, the Mask yep. of Tutankhamun. These are all portraits. And centuries later, millennia later, people are still curious about these people because of the portraits that survived. That's what portrait paintings do. Yep. Here's another thing. I paint what I call hero portraits. I'm striving to capture the a vision or crystallize a vision of the ultimate version of you so that on the dark days when you're wondering how you're going to keep putting one foot in front of the other you can see the portrait i've painted of you the vision i've crystallized of you and you say oh yeah that's who i'm striving to be that's what i'm capable of and on the good days it's a celebration of all you've already accomplished that's so there's two amazing. points about it. Yeah, absolutely. That's amazing, like an amazing way to actually position art on like portrait, like portrait anyway. Like it is, that's right. just, I think you'll just blow, like literally blow my mind to a point where I now kind of speechless, which is very rare for me. So if you had unlimited resources, unlimited money, time, everything, right? People, whatever, what world problem will you solve? That is actually one of the reasons I am so invested personally in portrait painting. And it goes to the points of value that I just described. The only reasonable or rational audience for what I do are high net worth people. High net worth people also tend to have a disproportionate impact with their decisions on the world. If I, if I could use proper grammar, let me try that again. The decisions of high net worth people tend to have a disproportionate influence on the world. That's that's we'll get my knuckles wrapped over that one. If I can create and crystallize a vision of such an influential person that inspires them by living with this portrait, 
if they see themselves as heroic, generous, upright, moral, ethical, honorable, if that's the kind of vision I capture in the portrait that I paint of them, then living with that portrait has a chance of inspiring them to act out those virtues, which will have a disproportionate positive effect on everybody who's impacted by their decisions. Yeah, that is so, a very interesting way of kind of of, of, of going yeah. around that. So that's kind of the mission behind what I'm doing with my portraits is I'm trying to bless the world by helping to inspire and ennoble and elevate the people whose decisions already have a disproportionate influence on the world. Wow. Wow. <laughs> That's, that is a really interesting way of going around it. So, I mean, I know you're primarily an artist that's now kind of obsessed with business, but what has been the hardest thing about entrepreneurship for you? Getting beyond myself. I mean, being an artist, being creative is a very maybe introverted activity. It's a very, there's there's a word that's escaping me. Uh, it, it's a very isolating or isolated activity. You're very much inside yourself in Absolutely. the creative process. Being an entrepreneur is a much more extroverted, outward-looking activity. And so I've developed a facility for doing both, but it's very difficult to switch from one to the other. The, it, changing gears is a slow process and takes a lot of energy. But in terms, so describe what I just described a moment ago about what kind of value is my work delivering? Well, I had to sit and think a long time about that. You know, it's like, okay, I have to articulate my work in terms that are relevant to the people I hope will buy my work. Well, what do they want? Who are they? Yeah. What are they looking for? What do they value? What kind of language do they use to describe things? How do they see the world? That, again, is a very introspective process, but it's an outward-looking kind of introspection, if that's even a thing. It's, it's, it's like looking outwards and trying to see the patterns. Like, why, why did they do that? I'll give you an, exa I'll give you an example that I, that I like quite a bit, because it goes back to the point you made earlier of, uh, you know, maybe the reason somebody bought that piece of art is because it is valued at insane amounts of money so you can get a pair of lightweight say cotton lounge pants with some fun playful design on it you know slices of pizza beer bottle caps whatever you can get that for about 15 dollars on sale at a place like walmart right yeah i know they don't have walmart in the uk and that's good for you uh you can get exactly the same thing probably even made in the same overseas factory for $300 at Saks Fifth Avenue or a place like Harrods. Now, why would anybody pay $300 for something that they probably know they can get for 15 at a different venue? What are they buying? The brand. It's very easy for people to dismiss that behavior as unethical and criminal it's like you know doesn't the store know how could they charge three hundred dollars for this when i can get it for 15 over here are they criminal are they crooks are they ripping people off are rich people stupid for for spending that kind of money it's like no they're not stupid they're not being tricked they know exactly what they're buying you don't understand what they're buying first of all they're buying the experience that you have shopping at a place like Harrods or Saks Fifth Avenue, as opposed to yeah. a, a place like Walmart, an entirely it's, different it's shopping experience. It's, it's it's the brand. It's the brand of of Harrods. It's when you walk it, in. Sorry, you don't touch the doors is, because you've got doormen opening your doors for you. Like yeah, yes. Thanks. There's an experience involved. Yes, part of it is the brand. You know, but you go shopping at Walmart. Nobody invites you to sit in a chair and asks if they'd like you to, if you'd like for them to fetch you a cup of tea. 
Nobody will ever do that at Walmart. But if you go to Saks Fifth Avenue or the top floor at Tiffany & Co. or a Rolls-Royce dealership, this is the kind of shopping experience you're going to have. That's part of what they're buying when they pay that money. Another thing they're buying is it's a reassuring experience to be able to spend that kind of money on something that they know they could get cheaper elsewhere, and you still can't find it on your balance sheet. It reconfirms their security in how well they're doing. It's psychologically reassuring. It's also socially reassuring because they're buying the opportunity to say, oh, well, yes, I did get that at Harrods. Thank you for asking. If it got around their social circle that they're buying things from Walmart, people would start to question their solvency. And how many business deals might they lose yes. because it got around that they were buying things from Walmart? So they're, that's something I had to learn and uh, to learn to understand that high net worth people are coming from a very different frame of reference than yes. the rest of the world. Yeah, absolutely. And that one is neither better or worse than the other. No. It's just different. And so if you if you intend to do business with high net worth people, well, you got to dump the middle class and lower class resentment of them for being wealthy. You just get rid of that because that's not going to help you at all. You've got to you've got to think like them. You've got to you've got you've got to treat money the same way they would. And that's very yes. hard if you resent them for being wealthy because Yes. If you are middle class and you are kind of like, and you're looking to work with ultra high net worth individuals, you've got right. to be as blasé as they are about spending a thousand pounds here or because, right. or even or, or more, but you have, you have right. to be able to be comfortable with that and comfortable with those ideas. Because if, for instance, you are networking with high net worth, ultra high net worth individuals, and then someone said, right. oh, yes, I spent £3,000 or five grand at, at a club last weekend. Mm -hmm. And you're thinking, well, that's, that's more than what I make in a month. Because obviously, that, and that's covered, like, all of your bills. You sit there and you're like, whoa. They will see that. Yeah. And they'll be like, yes. you're not on my level. Right. You mustn't be shocked or resentful of that. No, absolutely not. And here's it's one way that maybe them. you can achieve that. I'm sorry? I'm happy for them. Sure. Well, here's another way of looking at it. How many people got paid exactly what they asked for because of that? So that that uh, you know thousand pound or five thousand pound bottle of wine, somebody got paid to order that into their stock. Somebody got paid to open it. Somebody got a tip for bringing it to the table. Somebody got paid to let you into the place where you bought it. Somebody got paid yep. to drive it from the vintner to the venue somebody got paid to maintain the truck that drove it from the the vintner yeah. to the venue the vintner got paid i mean that's, everybody that got one paid bottle. that one bottle that you look at and go oh that dirty evil rich person who just wasted all that money on this self-indulgent experience they supported at least a hundred jobs yeah at least 100 at jobs. least 100 just... people got paid and yeah. not only did they get paid they got paid what they asked for yes yeah so you may resent them for being able to have those kinds of experiences but nothing stops you from saving up your money and buying those experiences yourself exactly priorities there is the only bar to entry for some of those experiences is money and here, here, here's the thing with money. It's made up. Money, is, money is basically, it isn't actually real. It's an idea that we've all agreed to engage with in the same way. Yep. But there's no, there's no limit to the ideas that you can have. There, ergo, there's no limit to the amount of wealth you can generate because money is just an idea. Yes. So stop resenting it and thinking of it as something alien and external. Get engaged in ideas. Yeah, absolutely. That is that is really, really, really sound advice for anybody who's listening. I mean, 
I mean, this podcast has been absolute chock full of really important golden nuggets, but that one in particular I hope so. is really important because I think it's look, I've I've been rich, I've been poor. I have been mm-hmm. and you know, I've had points in my life where I'm surrounded by wealth and because mm-hmm. I was ill, I was the richest broke person you'd met. This is my bank account zero, but I had a wardrobe full, wardrobe full of designer clothing and drive okay. a nice car and all that stuff. But, you know, because right. I wasn't earning any money because obviously I was ill. But, um, okay. you know, I've always, my attitude with money has always been, and also to, so just as to juxtapose that, I actually grew up in third world poverty. So the, 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 the contrast the between contrast is extreme for you it's extreme yeah absolutely yeah. so I grew up with no money and in a not great kind of situation and as an adult if I was when I was ill I was surrounded in a really good situation but still had no money because <laughs> I was ill for a long period of time which is fine it happens in life right but the thing is everybody gets those experiences exactly but and that's and that's the one thing that kind of it's it's almost like the one thing that makes us all equal is that we all have mm-hmm. ups and downs no matter where mm-hmm. you are now you might be sure. lower class middle class or wherever you are in society you're gonna have the exact same ups and downs as people who are ultra high now with because the Absolutely. only difference is where you, you lose like 100 pound they lose a million and it hurts them right, and it right. hurts them the same and it hurts them the same way so you know and it's yes well, I'm, 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 it's, it's I'm relative it's, i mean there are a lot I'm of like, people who I'm are like one, yeah a lot of it's relative there are a lot of people for whom they're they're one flat tire away from bankruptcy yeah yeah that's I'm a like scary it. place to be you know yes. um so i get the kind of panic and resentment that you can feel when you look at people who are insulated from that kind of danger i get it you know i've been there i get but it yeah you, know, you can you can pull yourself out of that it's mindset it's how you it's your attitude yes. towards money yes. i've always i've always yes. said this money for me it didn't matter what part of my life what stage i was in my life money i've always treated money like a river and it mm. flows and it just it ebbs and flows and sometimes there are periods of drought and then sometimes there are flood periods where like where monsoons have had the heavens have opened up and it's just monsoon and you know there are other times where it's literally as dry as it's Sahara. just depends on what's going on in my life but you know as it but it doesn't mean that it'll never rain again right even if it's raining even if it's monsooning it does not mean that i'm not gonna have a drought at some point so when it's right. right when it's monsooning, that's when you need to go. Oh, okay. Let me insulate myself a little bit more, right. so that if I do have a drought, it's not really a drought. The droughts will come, and the rains will come. Yes. Um. So when it's dry, start digging reservoirs. Yeah. And and that's making a, that's buckets. a really good idea. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> start making buckets and digging reservoirs. Um. You're going to see me outside in no. a minute with a shovel. And I'm no, like, it's true. Everyone's asking me, what, you know, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm digging a reservoir. It's going to rain soon. The money's coming. Money, there's always more money. Here, here's the thing. Money is, again, just an idea. What we'll, Whether we're talking about uh, hard currency or digital currency or barter, medieval barter or seashells and beads, it's all exchanges of value. That's all that's yeah. ever happening. That's yeah. all that business is. Figure out yep. what thing of value you have to offer, whether it's a product, a service, or both. Then figure out who's looking for that and do then do everything you can to connect yourself and what you do with the people who are looking for that. That's Absolutely. it's really as simple as that. I, I gave you some really funny examples in our chats earlier, a week or so ago. So, okay, maybe maybe you need a business, maybe you're in business, you want a business, and you feel like you just can't get past the idea of dealing with rich people. Fine. So you go with medium to low price things and you sell a million of them. That's a that's an option too. 
And whatever it is that you have of value or that you want to do, there's probably a way to make it work as a, as a business. I gave you a couple examples a, a week or so ago. There are people with online businesses making lots of money by creating diapers for pet chickens. Yep. Let me say that again yep. for anybody listening going, what? <laughs> you know, yep. People he did not start that. Chickens. Not a lot of people that have them all. Diapers. People have pet pet chickens chickens. and they don't like their pet chickens pooping in the house. And so they buy diapers made for pet chickens. There are people making money, making diapers for pet chickens. I'm just now visualizing my parrot wearing a diaper. Right. You know, so there's a lady in the middle. There's a lady from a few years ago, I, I, I saw this on the news. Uh, you know what beanbag chairs are, right? I don't know. I don't know if that was much of a thing in the UK, but that, there was a fad in the US with beanbag chairs. It still comes and goes. Well, there was a lady in the Midwest creating beanbag chairs in the shape of life-sized cows, and she had a successful business making beanbag chairs in the shape of life-sized cows. I use these two examples to hopefully illustrate to anybody listening that however weird your idea is, there's a market for it. It can can be a successful business if you approach it properly. And that is learning how to articulate the value of what you do, figuring out who's looking for that, and connecting yourself with that audience. Depending on how far out there your idea is you may have a larger or smaller audience but if you are passionate about it if you lie awake at night dreaming about doing this thing there are people out there in the world who are dreaming about having that thing for the same reasons you are obsessed with making that thing you're not nearly as weird as you might think you are you I'm have sorry, a anybody who somewhere. has pet chickens and puts a diaper on it is weird, okay? That's just weird. That is just Not weird. to them. <laughs> Not to them. They have found their tribe. And that's okay. Who's it hurting? The chicken? I don't know. But I mean, how many diapers does a pet chicken go through in a day? <laughs> a lot. Do you know how much birds poop? Like, literally. You know that, you know that, that phrase where you scare the shit out of someone? Yeah, I literally do that on a daily basis. When I walk into the room, Alfie literally shits himself. Literally. Because the the, well, the opening of the door scares him. For life. Well, then that company has repeat customers for the life of those chickens. My God. Right. So. Well, it was like I bought some, um, speaking of like pet stuff, I bought some twig stuff for Alfie from the Chew On. And there were literally twigs that somebody had picked up from outside and just put a, a little screw in it. And I was like, I paid 13 quid for this. Mm-hmm. Why did I pay 13 pounds for this? I could have just gone outside and yeah, when, yeah, when you could go outside with a saw, for you could pay 13 quid for a folding hand saw that's ideal for cutting branches out in the forest. You could uh, probably... You don't even have to do that. You can literally pence. just walk around and, and just pick it up from the floor. Right. Well, you could probably just pay just a few pence for an eye hook, which is that bit of hardware with a loop and a screw on the other end. Yeah. You want the saw to cut a clean end off of the stick so the eye hook can screw in properly and just make your own over and over again for the same money. Yeah. But well, no. I but paid no. 13 pound for four pieces of pathetic twigs. With, right. So with you can do the DIY sure. thing that we just described and save yeah. yourself a recurring 13 quid, or you can keep paying 13 quid for the sheer bloody convenience of not having to do that. Well, I there's another there's another set of toys that they have, and with birds, especially parrots in particular, they like to shred things. So there are whole there are paper things that literally is like worth nothing it's just paper Mm -hmm. and it's just for them to shred it and destroy it right and they're Mm -hmm. so expensive but there's one in particular that was literally just little cardboard squares cut together Mm -hmm. 
with a hole through it and just strung. And that's it. It's literally somebody has taken a sheet of cardboard and just cut it into squares for them to sit and chew on. And Mm -hmm. that in and of itself is like 10 pounds. And I'm thinking, Mm -hmm. do you know how much cardboard I throw out from Amazon? Right. So I've just started giving him the cardboard packaging because he loves that anyway. There you go. He doesn't care. He doesn't know what you spent. He just wants something to chew on. I bought so many expensive toys for him. He likes bottle caps, plastic scoops from like when you when you buy stuff that had like like protein shakes powder scoops from that he yes, actually loves yes. scoops he loves um toilet rolls you know cut the cardboard toilet rolls um yep. and cut anything cardboard any little box that he can toss around and fling it around yep. and yeah absolutely loves it so i was yep. buying him expensive toys you, yeah That's the point. but at the same time is that all you're doing or do you have maybe an emotional connection with your pet and by spending 13 quid on a bit of rubbish that you know you can get in the yard or out of the recycling bin and you're buying an expression of how much you love your pet, kind yes. of like the panhandler scenario, you are paying that because you know what it costs you to pay 13 quid. And it's a gesture from your heart that you know your pet can't comprehend, let alone appreciate, but yep. it's for you. It's yes. still a legitimate business transaction. Yep. So, and again, it comes back you know, down to buying I, the experience and believe, buying the brand. Exactly. I, I honestly believe that everybody gets at least one million dollar idea. And just about everybody seems to know it when they've gotten a million dollar idea. But very few people follow through on it. Yep. And that's a loss to them because I honestly believe you would get that. It's a loss to the that. world. Sorry. Um, it's not just a it loss to loss them. To the it world. is a loss to the world as yes. well. It's a lo- it is. Lost my train of thought. So I okay, get the million dollar idea. No, no, no. It's all right. But you're right. It is a loss to the world. I don't think they would have gotten that memo, that idea, if they weren't able to do something with it. No. But a little bit like going back to the drought versus monsoon idea. Uh, start digging your reservoirs when it's drought so that you're ready to catch the water when it does come. I wish people would start thinking when they're teenagers about business. Start studying. They're never going to teach you this in school. They could, they should, they never will. You have to appreciate what school is there for. It is not there to create entrepreneurs. It's there to get you trained well enough to be a reasonably useful employee yes that's its function that's all it does and that's all it's going to do yep so don't waste your time moaning about that accept it for what it is and accept the idea that if you want to do better than that you must self-educate and the sooner you start doing that the younger you start doing that you just as you get older and keep doing that, the advantage you have over people who don't increases at an exponential rate. I can give you my example. I wanted to be a veterinarian, or actually I wanted to be a veterinary surgeon or a forensic pathologist. I wanted this since I was a kid. It was one or the other. Okay. I loved working with animals, but it was either animals or dead people. One or two. Um, <laughs> Just as long as people aren't breathing, apparently that works. But then... Whatever when, churns your butter, I say. But honestly, it was... I think if you... And if you think of it, there's there's two... There's a very, very common thread between the two of them. It's figuring out a problem that can't be communicated to me. Curiosity. It, it's both heavily I, I see, my yeah. curiosity. But yeah, yeah. Going, back to, going back to that, it's... When I was doing my O-levels. I did sciences because obviously I was mm-hmm. on track to doing pre-med at least. Um, mm-hmm. And then when it came down to actually going to do med, my parents couldn't afford it. So I was like, right, cool. Uh, not doing A-levels because what a waste of time. Not doing college, not doing uni. What's a crock of shit? And I literally just went out to work. I went out to work. And I opened my own business at the same time because nothing 
nothing it teaches you about business more than doing it yourself. And that is where you'll really appreciate, you know, like if you if you if you started your own company from a young age and you really felt the pinch of it and then you went into employment and then you worked for a really, really good company, you'll appreciate that company way more. Mm-hmm. Because then you would appreciate the sacrifices that your bosses had to make to get the company to where it is and all that jazz. Because now you've because you felt that yourself. But I was light years ahead of my peers, light years anyway. Mm-hmm. I always knew that it was it was either going to be med or money, either or. Mm-hmm. And I went on the money route, and literally, I just I just did everything that made me happy. If I, I, I tried like dozens of jobs and I'd, I would stay in a company and then I'd leave after about six months because I've learned everything and I'm like, okay, cool. Next, let's try something else. I don't really like this. Right, and right. I was literally just picking and choosing and then going, hmm, I like this. No, I don't really like that. I don't like dealing with that. I don't like that. I don't like that. And I was learning along the way all of the things I did not yes. like, which was really, really crucial. I know when you yes. look at my my cv from when i was in like up until my early 20s it's a mess like it would look like the most unstable person ever but because i jumped from one different career to another went from photojournalism to new media to um literally like managing a company like it, it was it was everywhere it was absolute utter chaos right but when i look back on it now everything made sense the whole mm-hmm. thing because That's, it's yeah. it, it taught me so much but then all of it's come back down and then I've realized that it all had a common thread it was all marketing and brand related and that's when mm-hmm. I've kind of realized okay. oh and the things that I did enjoy was working with people even though I don't really enjoy working with a lot of people but it was it was very it was very human driven it was very humanized okay. and it was around helping yeah. people. And that's when I realized, right. oh my God, I like helping people. That's my feel good factor. There when I go. help someone and they go, thank you. And I'm like, oh, it's absolutely no problem. Like, don't worry about it. Like that's, that's my feel good factor. So I realized that's what I love doing. So then I built a whole career around it. And I learned that early. Hey, and guess what? There's lots of people. Every business business never figured marketing out. and branding. Every business needs marketing and branding. Very few do enough of it, and yeah. even those that do some of it do it so badly that they might as well not. And so, hint to anybody listening: become an expert in marketing and copywriting, and you will be employed forever. Yes. Same thing with sales. You know, if you can figure you, out what sales if you can do brand, is, if you can do a brand marketing and sales together, you are. Uh, unstoppable i can do brand marketing i've just not quite got the sales i'm okay right it's just one it's for me it's like a dirty word i'm like oh don't really like it but that's how a lot of people feel about it and i i like the way alex hormozzi describes sales sales is proper sales it's problem solving it's an it's a transference of conviction i like that i like i like that too and sometimes that means saying, I'm not sure I'm the right solution to your problem. Absolutely. So I, I've turned a lot of business down in my career because I literally look at right. it and think, mm, I'm not the right fit for you. Right. And that's okay. Somebody it will be. Yeah. In fact, one of my, uh, you know, second, third, fourth stage plans is to create a uh, stable, I guess you could say. Uh, So I have two companies. I have Cameron John Robbins, the Gentleman Artist, LLC. I also own the Gentleman Artist Studio, LLC. My concept is that while Cameron John Robbins, the Gentleman Artist, LLC, is my personal brand and the work that I personally create, The Gentleman Artist Studio LLC is an umbrella or holding company for myself and other artists. So if I have a client or a prospective client and they say, do you do pet portraits, which is a thing, I would say, 
I'm not the right person for that job, but I know someone who is. And start representing other artists, have, you know, landscape yeah. painters. I can paint landscapes. I just don't care. Uh, artists who do other things. And so create, to, to become an agent for other artists. Absolutely, become, become an artist, a, an artist agency. Agency, I think, yeah, a talent I think that's, agency that for is, fine artists. Yes, that is absolutely incredible. Yeah. And Furniture designers, you know, just yeah. become a a collective yeah. to where people know that the, the, the work is high quality yeah. and the recommendations are solid. And, you know, to build a brand reputation around that so that it becomes a go-to resource yeah. for any number of styles that you may be looking for. No, absolutely. I have, I love that. I love that idea. I think it's brilliant. Okay, so we are coming up to that time of the podcast. So what would be one parting gift of wisdom for the audience today? I believe in you. I believe in your greatness. I believe you have unlimited potential you are capable of far more than you can imagine the world needs you and what you can bring to it so whether you're a struggling artist or an entrepreneur making something that doesn't seem to have caught on yet but you know it's got the potential or whatever it is you're doing or whatever stage you're in keep going you can do it you may be closer than you imagine. Your next decision might be the one that changes everything. Wow. The only way to lose is to quit. Yeah, literally. So, I mean, look at what I'm doing. I I followed one of the most insane career paths imaginable. Yeah. I, mean, I tell people what I do and then try to talk to them as if it's a real business. And I, I see their eyes glaze over and the wheels stop. You know, the, it's like crashes the system. Like, I know I told you when I met you I was like I'm definitely showing this stuff to my mom because my mom needs to see this because I'm like mom look look right, this person right, has made a right, whole career out of portrait art right um see that's that's the thing that I get it with artists is it's like okay art is everywhere because design is everywhere so how can something that is literally everywhere fail to be a real job oh, explain that know. one to me I don't know. Well, I think... Anyway, I, I don't want to get sidetracked on that. It's like what, what, I, what I'm trying to say that, is... That is like a three-hour rant between the both of us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't get me started on that one. But no, it's it, everybody fails, okay? Everybody fails. Here's what's happening. I want you to... One thing, word of wisdom you want, parting gift. Think of, think of a polygraph or a seismograph test. The paper runs through the machine and you have that gizmo that makes a squiggly line depending on the intensity of you know yeah so you've got your baseline and you've got performance so you know this is like normal range and starts doing this you're like oh that was a big earth tremor or he just told a whopper that's everybody's journey okay the straight line is your baseline that's your goal that's your ideal that's the outcome you're looking for and this is your actual performance. Yeah. And just like a polygraph or a seismograph technician will sit and circle the greatest deviations from the norm, people look at their own journey that way and they circle those things and call them failures. So they go along, oh. you know, here's your ideal and you're doing this, you know, failed, 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 failed. No. Look at the that's, very same thing. That's when, that is when your, that's, gold because even if you didn't win at what you think you won at you won at something else you learned something along the way yeah well here, here's what i want you to imagine so imagine that side of the graph yeah. and the baseline recognize that in order to have those peaks and valleys you must intersect with the ideal so instead of circling every failure start circling every intersection you go succeeded 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 and Every time you have a peak or a valley and you turn back toward the ideal, circle that arc and say, still trying, still trying, still trying. Here's the thing with failure. You decided you wanted something. You made the best plan for getting it that you knew how to. And then you had a failure. Failures revealed to you the flaws in your plan. You didn't know about this. 
you forgot to think about that. You didn't account for this sufficiently. You are now armed with new information that will help you make a better plan with a higher likelihood of success. If failure yeah. shows up again, it's giving you yet more information. So no matter what everybody else says, because we're, we're, humans are really hard on each other when we fail. If I'm the only person who ever says this to you, I hope you hold on to this and remember it. When you fail, it means you decided you wanted something, you made the best plan you knew how to, and you went for it. Congratulations. You are a hero in your own life. Yes. You did the best you knew how to, and you went for it. That takes courage. That takes study and intelligence and determination. And again, courage. So congratulations. Well done to you. Do that again and again and again and again and again until you have what you want because the failure is teaching you all along that path with new information for making better and better plans with a higher likelihood of success. Absolutely. So keep going. That is literally like the best advice I've heard so far. Honestly, <laughs> that is, that is. So do you want to tell people how they can find you? My website is gentartist.com. And yeah, yeah can find that's them where you can see my work. <laughs> oh my God, guys, I, I, actually, go, media, go check it out. Yeah. I will post tell all of friends. the links. I will, I will post um all of the links, the show notes below and on, or in the description if you're watching this on YouTube and absolutely go have a look at it, share it, share this podcast, you know, get the word out. I think it's really important for us to talk about this in particular, especially this whole conversation specifically about sure. art, because I think artists are a little, a lot of artists are a little too hard on themselves and they've got this ideal that they feel that they need to reach. And I think that we need to start going, do you know what? that's bullshit that is not necessary we don't need that and just work on progress and and moving forward and keep trying because people get really caught up in the imposter syndrome of it all gods I am definitely one of them imposter syndrome had me frozen for like a year on these videos because I was like who the yeah, hell does this girl think she is about that I know I like about imposter syndrome yep. and I actually wrote an article in response because you made me yes. think about it yeah, you did. But I think your very, very, very first, um, your first response was overwhelming oh, yeah, I, arrogance. Yes, yes. And, How do and you that actually, imposter syndrome? Overwhelming arrogance. But you know what? That, <laughs> that is actually kind of what I do before I even get on camera. <laughs> I am like, right, listen up, Des. You are the best at what you do. You are the top in your entire industry. Gary V doesn't have anything on you. Gary V has just got a mouth on him and loads of followers. Well, you're, and you're way cuter than he is. So, of course, you know. everybody would prefer to watch me anyway. You know, absolutely. So, <laughs> but that, but that's literally what I tell myself and I get myself all psyched up. I listen to Cardi B yeah. before I get on camera. Like, honestly, <laughs> because there's something about Cardi that literally, it just makes me want to throw hands. It makes me want, I go into like beast mode listening to Cardi. If I listen to Cardi B when I'm driving, yeah, she'll be I that. will be really aggressive. That's kind of her niche. Yep, yep. But you know what? Yeah, that's kind of that, her niche. Whatever, whatever works for you, you know, get yourself yeah. all fired up and get in front of the camera and absolutely smash that imposter syndrome because guess what? It's just a voice in your head. I've actually named yes. mine. So my imposter syndrome's name is Manda and she speaks in this really annoying Valley Girl accent. So... You know the type that's like really annoying, that kind of like speaks like this, and you just really want to like punch him in the face. It's okay if you stop it. It's all right. Exactly. exactly. (laughs) The type that you literally just want to rip the vocal cords out. Now, Amanda, unfortunately, is blonde, wears a very short pink mini skirt. I don't know what top she wears. And she's obviously got a handbag dog. Oh, Basically legally blonde, you know. (laughs) But I actually really love Wish with a spoon, so no. But, you know, that's Amanda. Uh, I think it's hilarious head. that you've created a persona for that voice. I think that's, yeah. that could be a really intelligent psychological response to that. Well, do you know what I do? it as a yes. separate persona yes. that you can now dismiss. Because I just tell Amanda, sit down and shut up. You are stupid and stop <laughs> hating. 
It's like literally go shopping, go snort some cocaine, just go away. Go away. Go away. And it works. It really, really, really works. I mean, I told I did tell a psychiatrist about that once and she kind of gave me a little bit of a look. And I was like, and then she said, Well, if it works, and it was with a kind of a shrug, but I'm pretty sure that that, you know, I, I hope she like is not listening to this, but you know, because she's probably thinking, mm, maybe I should have had more therapy with her. But you know, if she's maybe. listening to this, it works. It, I just think if it works, just use it. It's a different method and it allows yes. me to personify something that is separate and apart from me because it allows me to say that my imposter syndrome is not my voice because it isn't right. really my voice. So that I can go, you don't know what you're talking about. Shut up. Go away. Right, right. Literally. Right. I, I did something similar to that just recently, discovered something like that. In terms, what's in terms of reality, what is the difference between a dream and a memory? Mm, nothing. Very little, if anything. And so, all of those painful memories that trigger insecurity and all those negative emotions—you know, reliving painful experiences—I've started dismissing them, saying it's that's just an illusion, like a dream. You do you do know that memories no value memories aren't the same as if it's happening again. Literally, when you remember a memory, you remember it from the last time you had that memory. You remember it, yeah. So copy every, of a copy of a copy. Exactly. So you can actually re- right. overwrite your memories, and that's why memory oh, is is a really it's it's a dangerous thing anyway. So and it's one of the most unreliable forms of proof because oh, absolutely. you can't, you can't absolutely. rely on it. Yeah. yeah. Once you've learned a lesson from it, just discard it. Of course, of course. But it also doesn't it mean that come... you dismiss anything painful. It means that you feel your feelings and you go through it because obviously you don't want to create right. any forms of invalidation for your trauma. But you feel right. it, and then you and then you go, and then you go. Right. Give me. I'm going to give myself right. five minutes. You set a timer. I've done this before when I've gone through traumatic events. I set myself a timer. Okay. I feel those feelings. When the timer is gone, it's gone. It's done next and you lit i literally okay. just go reset right cool right let's move okay forward. great that 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 and, sounds like a great idea so, yeah. something i've been saying for a while is because it, it's important to validate feelings up to a point so what i say is feelings are real because we really feel them yes but they are highly subjective highly changeable and they are freq- frequently a terrible reflection of reality. Oh, of course, of course. But, you know, for 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 people who are kind of going through something in particular, um, sure. you, know, you just want to make sure, because we, what I am trying to do as well in my own life is not perpetuate this, this scenario where we create this, this, perpetuate these feelings of shame around you know kind of grieving and having any form of trauma because that has actually been quite a a big theme in society and it's something that now we're kind of seeing kind of crop up but I will also agree that there needs to be a balance to that that not every single thing that you feel is has to be made into this massive mountain if it's a molehill it can just be a molehill you just stubbed your toe you didn't break it you do not need to go to the emergency room you there's no need to have a panic attack over a stubbed toe yeah. but yeah there's a lot it's of a stubbed toe when of... it's gonna hurt but recognize that a stubbed toe <laughs> is a stubbed toe unless ten you minutes whacked time. your yeah. foot on granite and then you've probably broken it and yet still right. the emergency room can't do right. anything for that anyway so you just gotta live right. with it Get some ice. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, a lot of people seem to store up their negative experiences as if they're chips at a casino that they can cash in. Yes. And unfortunately, society currently is honoring that kind of buy in in a very unhealthy way. Absolutely. Unproductive, unhealthy, unhelpful. It was amazing having you here on the Entrepreneur Spotlight today. Thank you so much for your time and your wisdom and all of your advice and everything in this. It's been amazing. I'm very pro-human. I believe there's room for everybody to succeed, and I want to see that happen. 
as much as possible. Thank you so much for that. You can listen to this podcast and many more on tiltnexus.com, which is our free platform for entrepreneurs across the world. See you on the Nexus.